The snow lashed against the window. Will was suddenly deadly cold, yet tingling all over. He was so frightened that he could not move a finger. In a flash of memory, he saw again the lowering sky over the spinny, dark with rooks, the big black birds wheeling and circling overhead. Then that was gone, and he saw only the tramp's terrified face and heard his scream as he ran. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger Traveling through this world below Hi, this is Ivy Tara Blair, and welcome to Ivy Reads, a series in which... I drop my audiobook skills a little bit and just read to you parts of my favorite books. As if we were two friends sitting by a fireplace in comfortable chairs, each holding a glass of wine, I hope, and I am sharing with you a part of a book that I just really love and hope that I can put across how much I love it and inspire you to read it too. This is a selection from The Dark is Rising by Susan Cooper. He opened the door a crack, and the wind whistled through again. Outside, Will saw a glittering white fog of fat snowflakes. No trees or bushes visible, nothing but the whirling snow. A chorus of protest came from the kitchen. Shut that door! There's your ceremony, Will, said his father, right on time. Much later, when he went to bed, Will opened the bedroom curtain and pressed his nose against the cold window pane, and he saw the snow tumbling down even thicker than before. Two or three inches already lay on the sill, and he could almost watch the level rising as the wind drove more against the house. He could hear the wind, too, winding around the roof close above him and in all the chimneys. Will slept in a slant-roof attic at the top of the old house. He had moved into it only a few months before, when Stephen, whose room it had always been, had gone back to his ship after a leave. Until then, Will had always shared a room with James. Everyone in the family shared with someone else. But my attic ought to be lived in, his eldest brother had said, knowing how Will loved it. On a bookcase, in one corner of the room, now stood a portrait of Lieutenant Stephen Stanton, R.N., looking rather uncomfortable in dress uniform, and beside it a carved wooden box with a dragon on the lid, filled with the letters he sent Will sometimes from unthinkably distant parts of the world. They made a kind of private shrine. The snow flurried against the window with a sound like fingers brushing the pane. Again Will heard the wind moaning in the roof, louder than before. It was rising into a real storm, He thought of the tramp and wondered where he had taken shelter. The walker is abroad. This night will be bad. He picked up his jacket and took the strange iron ornament from it, running his fingers around the circle, up and down the inner cross that quartered it. The surface of the iron was irregular, but though it showed no sign of having been polished, it was completely smooth. Smooth in a way that reminded him of a certain place in the rough stone floor of the kitchen, where all the roughness had been worn away by generations of feet turning to come round the corner from the door. It was an odd kind of iron, deep, absolute black, with no shine to it, but no spot anywhere of discoloration or rust. And once more now it was cold to the touch, so cold this time that Will was startled to find it numbing his fingertips. Hastily he put it down. Then he pulled his belt out of his trousers, slung untidily as usual over the back of a chair, took the circle, and threaded it through like an extra buckle, as Mr. Dawson had told him. The wind sang in the window frame. Will put the belt back in his trousers and dropped them on the chair. It was then, without warning, that the fear came. The first wave caught him as he was crossing the room to his bed. It halted him stock still in the middle of the room, the howl of the wind outside filling his ears. The snow lashed against the window. Will was suddenly deadly cold, yet tingling all over. He was so frightened that he could not move a finger. In a flash of memory, he saw again the lowering sky over the spinny, dark with rooks, the big black birds wheeling and circling overhead. 
then that was gone, and he saw only the tramp's terrified face and heard his scream as he ran. For a moment, then, there was only a dreadful darkness in his mind, a sense of looking into a great black pit. Then the high howl of the wind died, and he was released. He stood shaking, looking wildly round the room. Nothing was wrong. Everything was just as usual. The trouble, he told himself, came from thinking. It would be all right if only he could stop thinking and go to sleep. He pulled off his dressing gown, climbed into bed, and lay there looking up at the skylight in the slanting roof. It was covered gray with snow. He switched off the small bedside lamp, and the night swallowed the room. There was no hint of light even when his eyes had grown accustomed to the dark. Time to sleep. Go on. Go to sleep. But although he turned on his side, pulled the blankets up to his chin, and lay there, relaxed, contemplating the cheerful fact that it would be his birthday when he woke up, nothing happened. It was no good. Something was wrong. Will tossed uneasily. He had never known a feeling like this before. It was growing worse every minute, as if some huge weight were pushing at his mind, threatening, trying to take him over, turning him into something he didn't want to be. That's it, he thought. Make me into someone else. But that's stupid. Who'd want to? And, and make me into what? Something creaked outside the half-open door, and he jumped. Then it creaked again, and he knew what it was, a certain floorboard that often talked to itself at night, with a sound so familiar that usually he never noticed it at all. In spite of himself, he still lay listening. A different kind of creak came from further away in the other attic, and he twitched again, jerking so that the blanket rubbed against his chin. You're just jumpy, he said to himself. You're remembering this afternoon, but really there isn't much to remember. He tried to think of the tramp as someone unremarkable, just an ordinary man with a dirty overcoat and worn-out boots. But instead, all he could see once more was the vicious diving of the rooks. The walker is broad. Another strange crackling noise came, this time above his head in the ceiling, and the wind whined suddenly loud and Will sat bolt upright in bed and reached in panic for the lamp. The room was at once a cozy cave of yellow light. Then he lay back in shame, feeling stupid. Frightened of the dark, he thought, how awful, just like a baby. Stephen would never have been frightened of the dark up here. Look, there's the bookcase and the table, the two chairs and the window seat. Look, there are the six little square riggers of the mobile hanging from the ceiling and their shadows sailing over there on the wall. Everything's ordinary. Go to sleep. He switched off the light again. And instantly... Everything was even worse than before. The fear jumped at him for the third time like a great animal that had been waiting to spring. Will lay terrified, shaking, feeling himself shaken, yet unable to move. He felt he must be going mad. Outside, the wind moaned, paws rose into a sudden howl, and there was a noise, a muffled, scraping thump against the skylight in the ceiling of his room. And then in a dreadful, furious moment, horror seized him like a nightmare made real. There came a wrenching crash with the howling of the wind suddenly much louder and closer, and a great blast of cold. And the feeling came hurtling against him with such force of dread that it flung him cowering away. Will shrieked. He only knew it afterwards. He was far too deep in fear to hear the sound of his own voice. For an appalling pitch-black moment, he lay scarcely conscious, lost somewhere out of the world, out in black space. And then there were quick footsteps up the stairs, outside his door, and a voice calling in concern, and blessed light warming the room and bringing him back into life again. 
It was Paul's voice. Will? What is it? Are you all right? Slowly, Will opened his eyes. He found that he was clenched into the shape of a ball with his knees drawn up tight against his chin. He saw Paul standing over him, blinking anxiously behind his dark-rimmed spectacles. He nodded without finding his voice. Then Paul turned his head, and Will followed his looking and saw that the skylight in the roof was hanging open, still swaying with the force of its fall. There was a black square of empty night in the roof, and through it the wind was bringing in a bitter midwinter cold. On the carpet below the skylight lay a heap of snow. Paul peered at the edge of the skylight frame. Catch is broken. I suppose the snow was too heavy for it. Must have been pretty old anyway. The metal's all rusted. I'll get some wire and fix it up till tomorrow. Did it wake you? Lord, what a horrible shock. If I woke up like that, you'd find me somewhere under the bed. Will looked at him in speechless gratitude and managed a watery smile. Every word in Paul's soothing, deep voice brought him closer back to reality. He sat up in bed and pulled back the covers. Dad must have some wire with that junk in the other attic, Paul said. But let's get this snow out of here before it melts. Look, there's more coming in. I bet there aren't many houses where you can watch snow coming down on the carpet. He was right. Snowflakes were whirling in through the black space in the ceiling, scattering everywhere. Together they gathered what they could into a misshapen ball on an old magazine, and Will scuttled downstairs to drop it in the bath. Paul wired the skylight back to its catch. There now, he said briskly. And though he did not look at Will, for an instant they understood one another very well. Tell you what, Will, it's freezing up here. Why don't you go down to our room and sleep in my bed? I'll wake you when I come up later. Or I might even sleep up here if you can survive Robin's snoring. All right? All right, Will said huskily. Thanks. He picked up his discarded clothes with the belt and its new ornament and bundled them under his arm, then paused at the door as they went out and looked back. There was nothing to see now except a dark, damp patch on the carpet where the heap of snow had been. But he felt colder than the cold air had made him, and the sick, empty feeling of fear still lay in his chest. If there had been nothing wrong beyond being frightened of the dark, he would not for the world have gone down to take refuge in Paul's room. But as things were, he knew he could not stay alone in the room where he belonged. For when they were clearing up that heap of fallen snow, he had seen something that Paul had not. It was impossible, in a howling snowstorm, for anything living to have made that soft, unmistakable thud against the glass that he had heard just before the skylight fell. But buried in the heap of snow, he had found the fresh black wing feather of a rook. He heard the farmer's voice again. This night will be bad, and tomorrow will be beyond imagining. Midwinter Day. He was woken by music. It beckoned him, lilting and insistent. Delicate music, played by delicate instruments that he could not identify with one rippling bell-like phrase running through it in a gold thread of delight. There was in this music so much of the deepest enchantment of all his dreams and imaginings that he woke smiling in pure happiness at the sound. In the moment of his wakening, it began to fade, beckoning as it went. And then as he opened his eyes, it was gone. He had only the memory of that one rippling phrase still echoing in his head, and itself fading so fast that he sat up abruptly in bed and reached his arm out to the air as if he could bring it back. The room was very still, and there was no music. And yet, Will knew that it had not been a dream. He was in the twins' room still. He could hear Robin's breathing slow and deep from the other bed. Cold light glimmered around the edge of the curtains, 
but no one was stirring anywhere. It was very early. Will pulled on his rumpled clothes from the day before and slipped out of the room. He crossed the landing to the central window and looked down. In the first shining moment, he saw the whole strange familiar world, glistening white, the roofs of the outbuildings mounded into square towers of snow, and beyond them all the fields and hedges buried, merged into one great flat expanse, unbroken white to the horizon's brim. Will drew in a long, happy breath, silently rejoicing. Then, very faintly, he heard the music again, the same phrase. He swung around, vainly searching for it in the air, as if he might see it somewhere like a flickering light. Where are you? It had gone again. And when he looked back through the window, he saw that his own world had gone with it. In that flash, everything had changed. The snow was there as it had been a moment before, but not piled now on roofs or stretching flat over lawns and fields. There were no roofs. There were no fields. There were only trees. Will was looking over a great white forest, a forest of massive trees, sturdy as towers and ancient as rock. They were bare of leaves, clad only in the deep snow that lay untouched along every branch, each smallest twig. They were everywhere. They began so close to the house that he was looking out through the topmost branches of the nearest tree, could have reached out and shaken them if he had dared to open the window. All around him the trees stretched to the flat horizon of the valley. The only break in that white world of branches was away over to the south, where the Thames ran. He could see the bend of the river marked like a single stilled wave in this white ocean of forest. And the shape of it looked as though the river were whiter than it should have been. Will gazed and gazed. And when at last he stirred, he found that he was clutching the smooth iron circle threaded onto his belt. The iron was warm to his touch. Wow, <laughs> that is... When I first read that scene... Now, okay, let me give you a setting. For some strange reason, my mother had this book lying around when I was uh, about 19... And I had flown uh, across the country to spend the Christmas holiday with my family. And for some reason, she had this book lying around. My mom did a lot of book club stuff and, and a ton of reading. She's incredibly well read. But I'm not sure why her book club had read this young adult book. Maybe it had. I love young adult books when they're well written. And Susan Cooper's books certainly are. So I was sitting in the living room with all the lights off only the lights from the Christmas tree, and I was reading by Christmas tree light when I got to these scenes, the scene of the nightmare and the scene of waking up the next day and the, the magical change that was the beginning of everything he was going to go through. And I was glued to this image in my mind of emotion and cold and bewilderment and the deep, sudden surety that that rook's feather meant everything was different. That nightmare was just absolutely gripping as I sat in the Christmas tree light reading. I think I must have read three quarters of the book that evening. And then you turn the page and he wakes up and it's his birthday and it's midwinter day and all he wanted was snow for his birthday. It was the only thing that he was really excited about. And so he stands on the landing, and his joy at the snow is suddenly arrested by this complete change in reality. And he doesn't he hasn't had time in that one moment to feel afraid yet. He's still just in that emotion that that moment actually precedes wonder. When you are just completely buried 
in perception. And that moment in my mind when he stands there right at the edge of the emotion that will follow and then the actions that will follow. But those haven't happened yet. He's just right at that edge of perception. So here I am sitting on a chair reading this book by Christmas tree light. <laughs> and I'd never heard anything about it and I had no idea what was coming. But this has remained a book I read at Christmas every single year. I read it to my kids when they were young at Christmas. Um, and it turns into kind of a... <laughs> it's, it's not a sweet little Christmas book if you've read The Rest of The Dark is Rising, which I recommend. But it just... Uh, there are moments in the book that absolutely capture what I think of as magic. Not magic as display and not magic as ability, just the magic that we can actually have in the world as it is now if we just let ourselves have moments of naked perception without thought, without planning, without memory, without consideration, without judgment. Those, to me, are the moments that I would think of the most as magic. And we can have them here. But when an author can capture them in a book and weave them into the concept of the magic that she or he is using in the world building of the book, that is when I am the most convinced that magic is real in that book, in that story, in that setting to those characters. So that's why I read this scene to you guys. Why did I choose this for Ivy Reads when I, I have explained several times that these will not be fully polished audiobook readings? And then I give you this reading with, like, total right there. Well, I'm definitely overdoing it a little bit. This is me by the fireplace reading to you with our glasses of wine, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to tell you a ghost story, and then I'm trying to tell you a magic transformation and I wouldn't, I wouldn't carry it quite so hard <laughs> if I were reading the book professionally. And in fact, I have to say, and this is something that most people really don't think about, the audiobooks that raise the hair on the back of your neck the most are not usually audiobooks where the narrator is really raging. They're the reading of an audiobook where the narrator is just letting the prose carry the scene. Not reading in an emotionless way or in a monotone way, but letting the prose and the pacing carry you in the story. This has been a selection from The Dark is Rising by Susan Cooper. I'm Ivy Tara Blair, and I wish for you only the best. She said she'd meet me when I come. So I'm just going down the Jordan. I'm just going alone. I'm just.